Okay, hi there, and welcome to a revision webinar looking at the dynamics of market structures. This is for year two micro, your year 13 economics ahead of the A-level exams in the spring of 2018. Before we look at the, the main content of the webinar, uh, let's, uh, let's kick off with a few multiple choice questions. In slight twist to the usual, we're going to ask you to not just select what you think is the correct answer, but to uh, write down your level of confidence with each question, either as high confidence, medium or low confidence. So, for example, if you choose high confidence and you get the answer right, you score three. But if you get it wrong, your score is minus six. If you, if you choose medium confidence, you score two if it's right, but minus three if it's wrong. If you choose low confidence, then one mark for the right answer. Uh, but no marks for an incorrect answer, but no negative marks. So let's see how you do on this question. There are four, uh, four questions in total. So your maximum mark could be 12, and your minimum mark could be minus 24. Uh, we'll press the pause button, of course, at various points as we go through. So good luck. Here are four questions on market structures. Which of the following market structure characteristics is common to both monopoly firms and firms in monopolistic competition? Press the pause button, come back to me when you want the, the answer explained. So which is a common market structure for both monopoly and monopoly competition? The answer is D. Both market structures, firms in any form of imperfect competition, face a downward sloping average revenue curve, uh, which means that the marginal revenue curve will lie below average revenue curve. Firms have some discretion, some autonomy over the price they charge although they're influenced by the, the, the level and the elasticity of the demand curve. So the answer to question one is D. Here's question two. The table shows a firm operating under which conditions? So you've got some data there on output, total cost, total revenue. With which market structure would you associate these conditions? Press that pause button, have a go at the question, come back to me when you're ready. So what do you think? The correct answer to this question is C, monopolistic competition with increasing marginal costs. Just to show this, let's just uh, work the table a little bit more. So if we can work out from total cost, we can work out marginal cost. You can see the marginal cost is rising 15, 17, 20 and so on. So marginal cost is increasing. So it has to be um, C or D. Uh, crucially, the average revenue curve is falling. The price per unit is falling as output goes up. So therefore, um, the firm must be operating in, in monopoly competition. Answer is C. The next question. Firm is operating in perfect competition. What will be the effect on the firm's revenue if it increases its output by 5%? Have a go, press the pause button, come back to me when you're ready for the explanation. So, key thing here, firm is operating in perfect competition. Output goes up by 5%, what's going to happen to total revenue? The answer is B, it will rise by 5%. Firms in perfect competition face a perfectly elastic demand curve, they're price takers, therefore every unit of output will generate the same, can be sold at the same price, therefore total revenue is a linear function of the market price. Here's our fourth question. Why might an industry consist mainly of small firms? Why might an industry consist mainly of small firms? Have a go, press the pause button. I'll be back in a few seconds with the right answer. So how have we done this question? Uh, small firms suggesting a, um, a low level of market concentration, lots of smaller firms being able to survive in the industry. The answer is, a, correct answer to question four is A, dis economies of scale occur at a low level of output. You can visualize this in this diagram, showing the long and average cost curve. And you can see here that the minimum efficient scale, where you've achieved your economies of scale, is achieved at a low output level relative to the size of the market. And therefore, there'll be more scope for many small firms to make uh, a commercial rate of return. In terms of the other out, um, aspects, B is wrong. If you encourage integration, that means there's going to be more um, mergers, potentially more monopoly power. An international market for the product 
uh, it really encourages scaled production rather than small scale production. And many small firms survive because they produce a bespoke product, a premium product rather than a standardized cheap product. So hopefully you did well on those questions. We're just going to spend a few minutes thinking about market structure. Now market structure is a dynamic concept. It changes the whole time. And some of the most important features include how many firms there are. So the scale, for example, of domestic and foreign competition in the market can be can be calibrated, can be judged. We also look crucially at the market share of the biggest firms. The obvious measure of this is something called the concentration ratio. And this is used a lot in data response questions, for example. We think particularly about the nature of cost, including the opportunity to develop and exploit economies of scale. We also think about the structure of the market in terms of its vertical integration. So the supply chain from extraction of raw material to the final product for the consumer. Who, who owns the supply chain? Who has control over the, over the process from basic raw material to final product? Another aspect of market structure is the extent to which products are differentiated. How are they different from each other, both in actual terms and perhaps um, perceived terms, through, for example, through the effect of advertising? The, the strength of substitutes depends, uh, influences the cross price elasticity of demand. Crucially, increasingly in, in A level economics, we also have to think about the structure of and the power of buyers in the market on the demand side. So, is there evidence, for example, of some monopsony power in the market? And we also have to think about the, the turnover of customers. To what extent are customers willing and able to switch their supplier from year to year? So, think in particular there examples such as telecoms and banking and food retailing. When consumer churn is high, when turnover rates are high, the market structure often becomes more contestable over time. So these are some of the key aspects of market structure. The crucial point I wanted to take out of this session is that market structure is dynamic. And typically the people who set exams, they love industries, they love sectors where there is, there is change, perhaps with the arrival of challenger firms that, that could threaten the the, the power, the share, or the profits of established businesses. So look for markets where there is a dynamic at work here. Cost does matter. The nature of cost is a significant factor over time in influencing market structure. So, for example, the entry cost into the market will, will, will determine the contestability. Capital costs will vary from industry to industry. Con contrast, for example, nuclear power with, with small fast food uh, pizza delivery companies. In one case, the costs are huge of entering the market. In the other, the cost can be relatively low. We think, for example, of the effect of natural monopoly, big energy power networks, big platform businesses with huge overhead costs. These are businesses where the cost per unit falls as the scale increases. So it tends towards a natural monopoly. Equally, the market structure is influenced not just by the barriers to entry, but also by the exit costs, including the sunk costs. These are costs that are not recoverable if a business leaves uh, leaves an industry. So, for example, it could be very, very specific capital inputs or or highly uh, highly uh, intensive advertising and marketing campaigns. Sunk costs make markets less contestable, and some businesses in markets have natural as well as acquired cost advantages. They're close to key labour. They're close to ports. They have through vertical integration, they've developed a cost advantage by controlling the supply chain, if you like, from uh, from farmer to the fork of the consumer. Crucially, the cost variables do have quite a significant influence in structure. Essentially, when the minimum efficient scale is low relative to market demand, then the market will tend to be more competitive. When the minimum efficient scale is very high, then we tend towards monopoly, so certainly oligopoly, monopoly, perhaps even natural monopoly. Just take a look uh, to look at market concentration. So the standard measure of market structure in a level, this is often used in daily response questions, is something called the concentration ratio. Now there are other measures of market concentration, but this is the one that you'll be fine with. And what we do here is we take the sum of the market share by sales, for example, of the leading firms in a business in, in an industry. C3 ratio, we just take the top three businesses. The C5 ratio, we sum the market share of the top five. 
the rule of thumb is that if the C5 ratio is bigger than 60%, then the market tends towards an oligopoly. It's a rule of thumb. It's not a, it's not a hard and fast rule, however. Well, let's take a look at uh, some, some data. Crucially, the level of market concentration depends on how the market is defined. And we'll see this, see this in the following examples. So in our first example, we take the market share in 2017 for the global car market. This is taking all car sales in 2017 by brand. And you can see that Toyota and Volkswagen and Ford are the three leading firms. But no single car maker globally has more than 10% of the world market. Even though all of them, without exception, are significantly globally scaled businesses. So instead of looking at the global market, if we wanted a measure of concentration, we might perhaps focus a little bit more on the market share by region, who are the dominant players, for example, inside the European Union single market, or who are the biggest car um, producers and sellers in the United States or India or China. How you define the market influences the figure that you get. Here's an example for the UK then. So we just take one country. This is domestic gas supply in the third quarter of 2017. British gas has nearly a third of the market. The big six businesses, you can see on the left-hand side there, they dominate the market to a significant extent. So it's clearly an oligopoly with a dominant supply of British gas. The three firm concentration ratio is 54%. The five firm concentration ratio is 72%. So clearly on that rule of thumb, this is an oligopoly. But also notice just on the right hand side here, businesses like First Utility, uh, like Utilita, Green Star Energy and Ovo, which are essentially the challenger brands at the moment, trying to break through uh, to challenge the established dominance of the, of the major gas suppliers. What type of market structure are we looking at here? This is the Canadian brewing industry in 2017. Well, it suggests, of course, here that we have a duopoly, the two firm concentration ratio for Molson Coors and AB InBev, which bought a SAB Miller, of course, a year or two ago, is uh, closing on 60%. There are, of course, lots of smaller brewers in the industry. They take 40% of the market plus, but two firms have nearly 60%. That suggests the market is essentially duopolistic. However, if we take another part of the beer industry, if we just take the UK and we just take the premium bottled ale market, notice here again how you define the market will determine the result you get. So if we just take a segment of the beer industry, the market share of premium bottled ale, then we see that if we define the market as that, the five firm concentration ratio is... 49.5%, so not quite enough for an oligopoly. You have here, for example, some big businesses, Molson Coors we've mentioned, Marston's, Green King, producing some significant um, levels of, of output. But equally, you have the emerging businesses such as uh, Budog, doing pretty well. Uh, the industry here, I suppose, is tending towards an oligopoly, even though we know there are hundreds of smaller craft brewers operating in the sector. Indeed, the number of beer brewers, craft beer producers effectively active in the UK has, has really shot up in the last decade or so from uh, 725 in 2008 to well over 2,000 active beer producers in the UK in 2016. That figure must surely be a little higher now. The craft beer sector in the last 12 months has been growing in excess of 20% per year of course, some of that is the existing uh, mass scale producers such as Heineken and SAB Miller InBev shifting their attention to craft beer making, particularly craft beer in cans rather than bottles. But the UK now has over 1,700 craft breweries, many of which are relatively small producers. Indeed, there's more than 107 craft beer makers in London alone. So here we have a really good example of essentially an oligopoly in the beer industry, but underneath the surface, literally thousands of smaller scale producers aiming to you know, achieve some market share, yes, 
scale up production, yes, and hopefully make a profit. However, market structure is a dynamic concept. So we know, for example, already that the big global multinational brewers are already starting to acquire some of the existing craft beer makers. SAB Miller bought Mean Time in 2015. AB Imbev bought Camden Town in 2016. He's also bought SAB Miller to create a, a mega beer making firm. And in 2017, Carlsberg, again a huge firm, bought the London Fields Brewery. So as your big players are starting to snap up some craft beer makers like Camden Town and Mean Time, that will tend towards, again, a more concentrated market structure. This is the focus, of course, is that market structure is a dynamic concept. It's always changing. And that's something you can mention in your evaluation. Let's have a look at the denim industry. So here's a really good example of a, of a market where you might be given an extract, for example. The global denim, denim, denim industry is worth over $55 billion a year. Biggest companies, Levi's, uh, Diesel, G-Star Law, Pepe, True Religion. Those are the big firms. And if you did a calculation, you can work out that they take about 15% of the market. However, there are tens of thousands of small producers all over the world, including the, the producer here mentioned here, he had mentioned, produced in Wales, just produces 120 pairs of high-end jeans per week. Customised jeans produced by hand. Which market structure best fits this example? Well, probably, uh, well, it depends how you define the market. The five firm concentration ratio is just 15.5%. So globally, it's not oligopoly, it's probably monopoly competition. However, in the United States, we're probably much closer to an oligopoly. The market concentration depends on how you define the market. A couple of slides to finish with in this webinar. One is a slide you might want to print off, actually, or take a copy of which just basically tries to capture the essence of three key market structures. Monopoly, oligopoly and monopoly competition in terms of their key characteristics. And this is a really good way of revising this kind of the course. So with monopoly, you could have one firm, a natural monopoly, a working monopoly with more than 25%, a dominant firm has more than 40%. Oligopoly, a few dominant sellers, but potential for many, many more underneath the surface. And obviously competition, many competing sellers. Then we think about the types of products. In all three cases, uh, products are branded and differentiated. That's in contrast to perfect competition. Uh, in monopoly and oligopoly, the barriers to entry are quite high, whereas in monopolistic competition, the ease and entry of exit is a key feature. All firms have pricing power in these markets. Monopoly has strong pricing power, although the regulators, the industry regulators may... Um, impact on that and also elasticity. In oligopoly, of course, you've got to think about the likely reaction of your rival firms. We call that interdependence. Some firms have pricing power in monopoly competition, but it depends on the cross price elasticity. And the profits, monopoly makes high, high profits going forward because of barriers to entry. Same with oligopoly, perhaps accentuated by collusion. Whereas in monopoly competition, profits are competed away by the entry of new firms. So there's a contrast between three market structures. Another contrast you can make, for example, is between monopoly and contestability. Well, we have separate videos on contestable markets, so I won't necessarily go through the entire theory now with you. Just search for contestable markets on our YouTube channel. But the crucial point is that in a contestable market, you can have any number of firms. There's usually a lot of firms competing, and there's both, the th both actual competition and also the threat of competition affects the behaviour, the conduct of firms in the industry. So typically contestability tends to be more efficient than monopoly, um, but both types of market can have quite, uh, quite strong levels of innovation. Monopoly profits used to fund research, and the contestable market, of course, innovation is one of the key ways in which the challenger firms can try to disrupt the existing firms. So what I suggest for revision is you maybe print off these final two slides on the different market structures, and the gap between monopoly and contestable markets. Okay, thank you for joining in this revision webinar on market structures.